morning. Welcome to the second dedicated training in open data of the project promoting an open government ecosystem in Belize, implemented by the Trust for the Americas and the Department for Effective Public Management of the Organization of American States, with the support of the Embassy of the United States of America in Belize. In this session, we will share knowledge about open data principles, tools, and resources at the light of the multi-stakeholder work done with the leadership of the Open Data Charter. Uh, thank you very much to all participants in this training session, and thank you for our host institution in Belize, CITO, the Central Information and Technology Office, um, who, are, is, um, who, who, who have um, different officers connecting to this session uh, as we speak. Uh, my name is Mike Mora, and I'm a specialist of the Department for Effective Public Management of the OAS, responsible in this case for the implementation of this open government project for Belize from the OAS side. Today, we especially would like to thank the Open Data Shatter for participating of this training session for Belize. Uh, the Open Data Shatter leads a worldwide initiative that establishes open data principles and resources to support the fulfillment, the fulfillment of those principles for those um, countries or governments, not only at the national level, uh, but also at the local level, who adopt them. Uh, so thank you to its uh, Deputy uh, Executive Director, Ms. Natalia Carfi, who you can see in the screen, for joining us this morning. Uh, Ms. Carfi is connecting from Buenos Aires if, uh, in Argentina, if I'm not mistaken, if, I'm, if you, any of you are not in another part of the world. And I should acknowledge the fact that uh, she's taking valuable time off her busy agenda in preparation to the Open Government Partnership Summit taking place next week in Georgia uh, in, in Europe. Uh, as mentioned in our last training session this past Tuesday, these open data training sessions that we've started are oriented to a reduced group of government officers, that is you, uh, that uh, for the purpose of this project, we consider the Open Government Champion Network of Belize. So this is a very important seed um, in a very important process that we have started um, in order to, to train and build capacities on, on, on a small group of, of officials in, in Belize. So our goal is to embrace, specialize, and develop skills in this dedicated group of officers um, that could work as agents for change, willing to innovate and transcend in public service delivery through open government. So I want to thank you for your attendance and commitment. Please do not, do, as I said last week, do not miss any of the following sessions of the training program as these sessions have been coordinated in a progressive way. Again, the video and materials related to all sessions uh, of this training will be shared with you afterwards. We can, we encourage you to share that knowledge widely with colleagues and within your own institutions. For questions about the project and how to engage, please contact our project coordinator in Belize, Mr. Henry Wade, who is also connected right now, and you have seen in the chat, uh, he will be actively writing in the chat, and also uh, we're gonna hear from him at the end of this presentation during the uh, Q&A session uh, he will be moderating. As mentioned, at the end of the session, we'll, we'll have time for uh, questions and answers uh, with the speaker. So uh, we ask you to please prepare your questions and share your questions uh, throughout the presentation uh, using the chat uh, tool on the bottom right of your screen. Without further ado, uh, I would like to present the speaker of the day, Ms. Natalia Carfi. Again, you'll see her on the screen right now. Beyond her role as a Deputy Executive Director of the Open Data Shatter, she worked as the Open Government Director for the Undersecretary for Public Innovation and Open Government of the Government of Argentina. That until very recently, um, we, uh, where she coordinated uh, the co-creation of the third Open Government National Action Plan, um, a project that engaged 15 national ministries, the legislative and the judiciary powers, 11 provinces, and more than 400 participants from civil society. She has also been Open Government Coordinator for the Chilean government during 2014 and 2015. She's part of the Open Data Leadership Network and the Academy, Academic Committee 
of the International Open Data Conference. Me, myself, uh, in, uh, with the Organization of American States, we have worked with Natalia for quite a bit uh, in all these roles. Uh, finally, Natalia will support now the delivery of the Shattered Strategy, engaging with experts from government, civil society, organizations, academics, and private sector. She will also support the development of plans to deliver projects in collaboration with the Shattered Network. So, uh, very excited to have Natalia here with us. Uh, we couldn't ask for a, very spe a, a, a better speaker to talk to us about open data principles and the resources that have been developed, created, and, and, and shared uh, with governments um, to uh, deepen in, uh, open data uh, in, in, in the world and certainly here in the region. So, Natalia, this, uh, from this point on, uh, the, the floor is yours, uh, the camera and the microphone. Um, please feel free to turn it on while I uh, put your presentation on the screen and you can, you can begin. Thank you very much, Natalia. Thank you very much, Mike, and uh, thanks everybody who connected. I'm super excited to be part of this of this project. Um, as Mike said, we've we've worked together before, and it's always been a pleasure to collaborate with the Organization of American States. Um, I've I've been a government official my most of my professional life, and this is my first time being part of a civil society organization like the Open Data Charter. Uh, so. Thank you very much for the opportunity, and do not hesitate to ask any questions, um, because we're here to talk. Uh, I guess on Tuesday you, you've gone through what open data is, but I didn't want to leave uh, a brief explanation now. Uh, as you can see in the, in the slide uh, for, for the charter and for everybody that works on open, on open data, open data is a, a digital data get, that is made available uh, with technical and le legal characteristics that are super important in order to be freely used and reused. Uh, anybody should be able to uh, get that data without any barriers, um, and it should be timely. We see open data as a key public good. Uh, it can create actually new public value, and re governmental representatives and uh, are creators of data, but are not the owners of it. That's why we need to publish it, and publish it in certain ways that allow the reuse and can help support uh, new economic benefits, new innovations to better, uh, better to help better development of public policies based on data. Uh, and for that, we have to work hard with governments to get to that point where you can actually publish the data that you produce. Okay, so the Open Data Charter is a collaboration between governments and experts uh, that was born in 2015. Mike and I were there in, in the first conversations. Uh, the idea was to have an umbrella, uh, an, an umbrella document and institution that could actually allow the conversations between all the key actors of the open data community, uh, both governments, civil society organizations, and uh, certain certain uh, private organizations. We are lacking the, the private side in the open government uh, open open government movement, but they are most mostly invited. Um, and after four pers like personal meetings uh, in with the, the experts and a public consultation, both in English and in Spanish. Uh, we've come up with six principles uh, that explain how governments should be publishing the information. Um, all, all that with the horizon or the aspiration that data should be published open by default, and timely, and interoperable. We will, we will further go into those, uh, into those principles to see what the charter means uh, in, in its wording and what the, the adopters actually do when they adopt the charter. The mission of, of the charter um, is actually to embed open data as a central ingredient for achieving better solutions uh, for the most pressing challenges. When we speak with governments, of course, is to uh, 
try to be as transparent as, as you can, uh, try to be as collaborative as you can, because via open data, you can better collaborate either with other ministries uh, and design better public policies, or with civil society in the big scope of what civil society means. Uh, so you can collaborate with universities to uh, develop new research uh, and develop new programs. You can collaborate with civil society on, on transparency issues, on anti-corruption issues, but also on any other vertical issue. You can open up data on climate change. You can open up data on agriculture. You can open up data on pretty much anything. Uh, and it's good to engage with civil society um, while you are designing your open data policy because they are going to be the key reusers of, of the data. And opening up data is, is not cheap nor an easy task. Uh, and to have those conversations and that collaborations going throughout the process of the design of the open data policy is key to its success. Um, we, the Charter, have uh, a network of governments and organizations from all over the world that work with this, uh, with this view on, on open data. OK, so how do we do this? Because it, it all uh, sounds perfect in the wedding, but it's, it's more challenging. Uh, we set norms, and as I said, um, we try to be the node of these conversations. There's a lot of open data organizations working right now on a global scope. Uh, there's a lot of open data standards that are being created and are being used and tested all over the world. Uh, but as sometimes happens in, in governments, these organizations do not talk among each other. So they might be creating standards that are not interoperable uh, among themselves. And the charter is the place where uh, to discuss these things. Um, so we try to break the isolation of the institutions, both governments and, and civil society, uh, around these conversations to, to uh, leverage better the work that has been done. And then we help and, and actually develop uh, demonstration projects. So we have this tool that I will introduce that is called the Open Up Guides which are guides on, on, on which data sets to open if you're trying to develop a, a specific policy on a certain topic. Uh, so we do all, all the, the research and the collaboration with organizations and governments, but then we implement it um, to check if, if the, the guide is actually working and to make it actually better. Because after the implementations, of course, there's been, uh, there's been always uh, a lot of lessons learned, and so we 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 work and and redo the open up guides after the, the implementations, uh, after this new information comes. Um, so this is the the way we view the data impact framework. Uh, you will see three different colors. The first uh, the first process is data availability. Then the second process is the data reuse, and then accountability. Um, these are five really um, to the point uh, uh, steps where, where you can see we start with, obviously, the data production uh, and the, the data sharing. Those are, those are processes that are mostly with, done within government. Uh, we have to you have to, as government officials, to create the data infrastructure that actually allows this to happen. Um, there's been a lot of experiences, uh, and I've worked in different countries, where uh, the data that is being produced is not even digitalized. So you cannot even start speaking about opening up data if you're having all your information in paper. Um, so you first have to focus on how the data is produced within the systems of the government. Then step two would be going to data sharing. And that's, of course, building up the infrastructure to share that, that data, but also take a very good look and work on the legal aspects of opening up data. Uh, the, the, one of the, the first principles of, of the charter is open by default. But of course, that we acknowledge that there is personal data that should not be open, 
that there's national security data that should not be open, and then each country has its own legal framework that should be addressed in the in the processes of, of opening up uh, data, and uh, and maybe there's there's some needed uh, changes in certain laws, uh, and so the legal aspect of it it's also super important. As you've seen probably on Tuesday, um, we know, we need also the regulation. Of the of the sharing possibilities of the data that we are opening up, uh, the the um, legal framework that is attached to the to the data is super important because it al it allows the reusers to understand how they can reuse it, to which cases uh, and to which purposes that data can be can be used. So it's super important to work on that also. Then of course, I once again having put in place the data infrastructure. Uh, processing the the data and and reaching out to the reusers to take action and start actually uh, reusing the the data that has been published and and that is where the open data community I think has matured from its first moments when it, it was born um, the first wave of open data portals uh, had a, had a, an objective of just Putting out the data out there, building up the, the open data portals and putting whatever um, whatever data sets seemed more easy uh, to to open, and it was based on the culture of open open up data and they will come. The reusers will come. They will reuse whatever data the government publishes. And we are uh, we've been shifting in the in the last years uh, to a, a view of publish with a purpose. Uh, you have to engage with the reusers first in order to be able to to get a purpose before you open up the data. Like, what is the key question that I'm trying to answer by opening up this data? What is the key challenge that I'm facing as a government, and which is the data that can help both civil servants and organizations from outside the government to have the the answers to those challenges? So it's really important to address um, the, the collaboration needed in order to have a successful open, open data um, policy. Uh, and then, of course, as part of opening up the process of open up data, uh, we need a response mechanism. Uh, government should be open to collaboration, to comments, to probably some uh, some critics, uh, but we need to have a, a responsible mechanism to to have a proper response to those that are using uh, the data. Okay, so here we go. These are the six principles that uh, were were uh, put into place after a long, long process of collaboration among uh, experts. So as you see, uh, they, are, they are quite short and easy to understand, um, but we will go through them uh, so you can have a look at, at what these principles actually entail. So open by default is the first one. It's probably the most controversial one also because uh, there's a lot of, of governments that just um, feel afraid to adopt the charter because of this, of this um, principle. It's, it's a super high bar, but we are not expecting everybody to sign the charter and open up everything they've got. It's, we understand this is a process uh, that, that grows throughout the time, and, uh, and so do not be afraid of the open by default principle. Uh, what do we mean when we talk about open by default? Uh, it's data that can be held Either by national, regional, local, or city, city governments, as as um, Mike said, we have adopters from ver various uh, levels of, of government, mostly national governments and uh, local governments. Those are our, our key adopters. Uh, we don't have much of states, uh, states or provincial levels of, of government adopting the the charter. We're working on that. Um, so the idea is to have those all the levels of, of public governments, the international uh, bodies also need to be transparent so everybody can actually uh, publish data. 
uh, what we think is that government data is of value to the society and to the economy. We create, we can create public value out of the publishing of, of the data and governments by default actually create data all the time, every single day. Uh, and that uh, the fact that it's not open is actually a held back from the big work that is running uh, a government. Um, we, of course, try to, uh, as I said, be the hub of these conversations and trying to harmonize uh, the open data, the open data understanding, the standards, the ways the open data ex is exchanged. Uh, but, and super important, as I said before, uh, having into account the right to privacy, the, 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 the use of personal data, the publication of personal data or not, uh, and that is key. You have to have those tough uh, questions and tough conversations while you are developing your open data, uh, open data policy. It's super important. Uh, there's been more than one case where personal data has been published, and uh, and it went. It, it, it's it's a uh, it's a problem with with the rights of people to their own privacy. And uh, of course, governments manage a lot of personal information to better service and better create public policies, but that, that should be kept within, uh, within government. What do the adopters do uh, to fulfill this, this uh, principle? Um, we expect them to be transparent uh, also, so we have all the adoption letters in the web page and their action plans. Um, you can see here uh, a, a piece of, of what they do, actually. They, they are responsible to us and to whoever wants to check uh, what, what, on what they are doing to fulfill the principles. As I said, we do not expect our, the governments to fulfill and totally complete the six principles at once. We know this is, this is a process and this is hard, uh, but we, we decided as a, as a community to set the, the high bar on this. Timely and comprehensive. Of course, it has to do with um, with the need of the data to be published as soon as possible, uh, and and there's there's a lot of value on on that. Not every piece of, of data is actually um, is actually redoing, redone every every year. There's, for example, census information that uh, can be can be updated uh, every 10 years, and that's OK. But if we're talking about, um, for example, expenditures or public procurement or, um, or trans transportation data, the, the fastest we publish that data, and we, we actually, um, and we, I sorry, the, the English word, uh, <laughs> and we update that data, the most helpful it is. The, the, the example, the super simple example is uh, buses, the data, like the routes and the timetables. And there's a lot of apps that have been created with the publication of that data set on a, on, on a very updated manner. And so people can go to the bus stops on time and do, do not miss their buses and then can actually uh, program their day in a better way. Um, then, of course, as I've already said, the importance of consultation to prioritize the data for release uh, is super important to get those conversations going. There's a lot of, of places where, the, where there's not an open data community, uh, and so it's good to, to try to create it, to, to have those conversations with you, probably with universities. Is, it's the, the first conversations to have, uh, civil society organizations. So as you, as, as civil servants, as part of governments, are actually uh, going through this process of, of developing an open data initiative and learning about open data, that is also needed in universities and in civil society organizations. And it will be super helpful for your own policy, because there's nothing that, uh, that is more frustrating than 
going through the whole process of building up uh, an open data portal and then nobody uses it. Uh, in order to create public value, we need the reusers. So the, the, um, the, that, that conversation needs to be, to be going. Um, and then, of course, the quality of data. Um, the, the, the data should be published in its maximum uh, quality possible with good metadata that actually explains the data set. Uh, and, and allows the reusers to, to know when the data is going to be updated, which are the legal frameworks uh, that, that is included in that, in that uh, data set, and the quality is super important for the reusers. Okay, so what do they do when they, when they adopt the, the charter? Um, these are the list of things, of course, we need to know. Um, we need to know what they're going to publish, how they're going to publish, to give us the updated links, uh, the disaggregation of the data, they are, they are actually open, uh, and of course work with us on, on getting this going. We do not want uh, the governments to go alone through this process. Uh, both me and the, and, the deputy, and the director of the charter were government officials, we know what, what uh, what is to go through this process, um, but we need to set the, the, the bar high. Accessible and usable is the third, the third principle. Um, so the idea is to have data-driven public policy, uh, the, the, to have better co-creation of public policies and have better informed decisions in order to be m more successful uh, in, in all the aspects that a public policy can, can actually be successful in as, as, as spend, um, the expenditure of resources and the teams and everything. And then, of course, the data, the open data portal, everybody sets up an open data portal, should be uh, discoverable, of course, and, uh, and super accessible, and not have any bureaucratic or administrative barriers, like you do not ask for a login, um, you sh should not, in theory, be caring uh, on who is actually uh, downloading the data sets because the data sets are for everybody. Um, so uh, that's what we look for. Of course, these are the, the activities that the governments usually do, publish the data on a central portal. Uh, there's a lot of countries like, like Argentina, for example, that has one central portal where all the data sets are gathered, but then each ministry has its own portal. Um, and the central portal just takes, on the, takes the information from, from the ministry, ministerial open data portals and puts it all together. It's, it's, it's a, a, a good way to encourage the ministries to publish data. They want their own portals to have their own communications with their own communities, uh, but there should be also one several portal where everybody can go and take a look at everybody's data. Um, then, of course, work with uh, existing standards. There's a lot of standards that have been developed and are being used. Um, like the open contracting one, and like the, the, the public procurement. So we can help out governments that are developing their, 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 open, up, uh, their open data initiatives to take a look at which standards already exist, which are the tools that already exist, so to not reinvent the wheel, and to start publishing in the best uh, quality they can. Uh, and then, uh, if you see F here in this list, the, the number, the number, the letter F, uh, raise awareness on open data. This is what I was talking about. Uh, the open data community in each country is super important to to help out develop that because uh, we need the reusers. Comparable and interoperable. Um, so this is what I was talking about. The different. Uh, the different standards that have been created throughout the years, uh, we need it to be inter interoperable. So if, uh, if, if each of the organizations that are developing standards just works within their own vision, 
uh, we might be lacking the possibility to inter to interconnect those databases that are actually being opened. Um, so the data should be easy to compare between sectors, locations. It's super important to have um, the collaboration inside of government uh, to to agree on certain uh, on certain wordings, on certain ways of calling, for example, certain cities or how the addresses are going to be uh, written into those data into those data sets. Uh, because I've had more than one experience where within the same government there's like three or four ways to call the same location, for example. Uh, it's important to harmonize that information within the government and then, of course, work with the international standards. Um, so this is what the governments, what the adopters, which are always governments, do um, when they adopt the charter and work with this fourth principle. Um, it's super, I, I just said, said it uh, super fast, but it, metadata, it's super important also. Uh, the metadata gives the context of the, of the data set that it's, that it's in that portal. It, it has all the information about the legal aspects of the reuse of that data. It has the information on the how updated the, the um, that data set is. It has the information also on the standards that it's being used uh, to, to provide that information. It has the information on who is responsible for that data set and, prob and probably if it's, if it's good metadata, also the contact uh, the contact info of the person that is in charge of that data set. Um, the idea is to is to have as much information as as, as you can that gives context and actually ex explains what the data set is about. Because government data, uh, when when you work with the government data, there's a lot of of keywords that for us being um, government officials, it's super clear. But for the reusers that work outside uh, of the government, uh, those keywords mean, mean different things or, or that don't mean anything. So it's super important to have good metadata that gives this uh, context to the, the data set. And then, of course, the, the fifth, we, when, when we were in the discussion of the Open Data Charter, we had, um, at the beginning, we had only five principles, and then we ended up with six. This one is uh, the one that where we, we were discussing and, and then decided to have a sixth one. Um, of course, the, the open data is part of a, of a bigger movement that it's open government. And the idea is that open and up data and having a, a, a transparency policy actually allows to have better participation because all the actors in the participation process will have most uh, better, sorry, better information uh, to be able to participate and, and influence and co-create with government better policies. More, more information allows deeper discussions and deeper conversations. So uh, it, it, it actually opens up the possibility to have a mature conversation and to develop trust in public institutions because the, the people know what the government is actually doing and, uh, and can help in better ways to develop this, these new policies. Um, the idea is that uh, collaborating with, with civil society helps out creating more public value. And it also uh, strengthens the government and the rule of law. Uh, this, it's been said a lot that trusting governments is it's sinking. And, this open government policies, open open data being one of them, one of the key uh, public policies when you engage in open government, um, is also it's also part of, of that. Okay, so here are uh, once again the activities um, the activities that government uh, governments do when they adopt the, the charter. Uh, for example, you will see here the freedom of information law or access of, of information law. That is um, actually a law that that works as a, as another channel for transparency uh, because it's allow, it allows 
it allows sorry for that it allows citizens to know how to ask uh, how to ask government for for data when they are not actually publishing it um, so you have like the the government publishing without being asked and you develop the open data uh, policy but there should be also a legal a legal way for uh, for citizens to ask for information that the government is not uh, publishing for inclusive development and innovation this is the sixth principle that i was speaking about um, this one was born in in chile in a conversation in in chile um, of course we are all in the process of of working towards sdgs and uh, and so inclusive development is is one of the key ideas that is drawn with uh, with the open data policies um, open data can be used for many 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 purposes and we actually uh, do not know the possibilities of reuse so um, open data it stimulates creativity and innovation in ways that we don't even uh, we don't even get the chance to think um, of course with uh, publish, publishing with a purpose uh, statement we 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 say that it's better to have a challenge and then decide which which data to open uh, but uh, it's the you know, social challenges it's something that we all in the region have as, as countries um, so these had to be part of the charter um, and then as, as we've been talking about the government roles that not end with the release of the data. It must, it must and we must uh, take an active role in understanding the reuse of the data in order to provide better data uh, the next time and to have more reusers using that data and to be able to uh, to reuse it our own data. Like you are working hard on opening up data as, as civil servants, uh, you should also be working hard on learning how to reuse that data and how to. Uh, to actually develop better data-driven policies. Um, this is part of the activities that, that the governments that adopt the, the charter uh, face. Uh, so support the creation of a rich open data ecosystem. I've said that throughout my presentation, I think, uh, a million times. Uh, the idea is to also get to the point where you can co-create data sets with civil society uh, because they can also help out uh, gathering data that is super important. Uh, it's very important to connect with uh, education institutions that can start explaining what open data is and what is the value that can be aggregated with the publication. So engage with schools and post-secondary education, education institutions, uh, of course, support research with open data that's where universities come into into place and researchers come into place this is a, a new uh, a new information that they can reach and they can reuse freely so new research are key and there's a lot of, of new reusers that were born out of the out of the open data policies throughout the, the hemisphere there's actually data journalism now for example so there are journalists that just do the research and their publication based on open data uh, government portals. And they, they extract their news and their new info out of the data, uh, open data portals. Uh, and the idea is that uh, the, the last one, empower the future generations of, of data innovate, innovators. Uh, the community has grown and has matured. We're still, uh, we're still growing and we need to be able to develop strategies to bring in more people and the new generations to this because this is only going to grow. This is just a brief presentation on how adoption goes. Um, we need a high level, a high level um, statement of support and then of course uh, the explanation on how you, how you intend to work on the six principles. As I said, we do not intend all the governments to work on the six principles at the same time and open up all the, da all the data in like one month because you've signed the, the Open Data Charter. Uh, we need the, the, 
we will go through the process with, with you. And that's why we have a resource center. Well, this is part of our network. You can see there we have a lot of organizations that work with us. We collaborate with zillions of other organizations that work both globally, uh, regionally, and locally, depending on, on the project. Um, so you can see that we, we would be able to, to help out with discussions with a lot of other organizations, organizations that might be working in your country. And this is what I was talking about. We have a web page that, uh, that Mike has, has, has uh, sent the, the link through, through the chat room I saw there. But I, I wanted to talk, talk about four of our resources. You can then go to the, to the resource center and take a look at everything. Um, we have the Open Up Guides, and we've just launched an Open Up Fields Guide, which is the new methodology to create an Open Up Guide. The Open Up Guides are really straightforward guides to, for the governments to know which are the key data sets to open when you're talking about a specific topic. So we have, for example, the Open Up Guide on Anti-Corruption. So there's, there's 30 data sets that have been uh, singled out as the most important data sets to, to fight corruption. Um, and, uh, and all the structure to develop, to develop and to publish uh, those data sets. The Open Up Guide on Anti-Corruption, anti it's super, super uh, straightforward and has been implemented in Mexico. You will see also in the Resource Center the report on implementation in Mexico with all of its challenges and all of its wins. Uh, and so we are not working on, on uh, making those minor changes to the guide uh, out of the lessons learned of that implementation. So we have, as one of the resources, the field guides that give the whole methodology to create a new open, open up guide. We won't be able to create open up guides on every topic there is. So we decided to publish and share the methodology that we use. You have the open up guide on anti-corruption. That is this guide that I, I've, already, I've already talked about. Um, so, and you have the report on, on the Mexican implementation. Then we have an open data charter measurement guide that it's an excellent uh, piece that was done by collaborators of the open data charter that actually has all the possible measure mechanisms that there are in, in the open government community. Uh, and it, it made the, the, the document, sorry, mixes up the principles and which measurement mechanisms they are there in the, in the open government community. So if you're talking about open by, by default, you might, be, um, you might be checking the open data index or the open data barometer. If you're talking about um, timely and comprehensively, you might be talking about the ODI's index. And uh, so all those, all those indexes and standards that already exist that can help out measure Different, different parts of an open data policy are all there in a very good and structured uh, document, which I, I encourage to, you to go through. And then we have an open up guide on agriculture that was um, developed with Godan. Godan is uh, a coalition of institutions that works on opening up data on agriculture, uh, and it's, it's been working for a long, long time. And they had developed a zillion documents, but it was so much information that um, it, it didn't come through as, as an easy, easy task. So we worked with, with them to have this uh, super down-to-earth document where you can check out if you want to open up uh, information on agriculture, which are the key data sets uh, that were selected by this great network that it's, that it's golden. Uh, and you can start working and leveraging if, if you're up uh, to, the, to the task of opening up that data. There's, there's the link in, in there and in the chat, uh, in the chat room of the resource center. There's a zillion more documents there uh, because as you saw, our network is, is huge. So we collaborate with everybody and, and we publish everybody's documents. Uh, so I encourage you to, to take a look at it. Uh, but these are four of the, of the type of resources that we create. We want to be super down to earth and super helpful with governments. Um, and of course, deep re researches are needed, but uh, 
it's it's always good to have like a super clear down to earth document that allows you to leverage if you're in the in the moment of opening up certain data sets or not. And I think I'm I'm done with the presentation, uh, and uh, I'm open for for consultations, questions, comments. I want to thank you, Nati, uh, for uh, for the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, very insightful. Um, if there is a place uh, to start uh, when implementing open data, uh, that should be. Uh, the principle certainly uh, and the open data shatter and uh, obviously the value of this beyond the definition of principle uh, on open data it's that there are resources that have been developed to support the implementation of those uh, principles so this is this is great because um, it's basically uh, the, 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 the basis um, uh, with uh, any country, any government, either at the local level, national level, could build uh, their open data initiative. We have definitely um, stated that in different processes that we had supported from the OAS in terms of policy development, open data policy development, and from um, the different experiences that we had supporting countries in the development of those uh, open data policies, national open data policies, all of them had taken into consideration the principles of the open data shatter. So there is no need to reinvent the wheel. The principles are there. Um, that's important. Um, and, and of course, all the support that comes, uh, that comes with it. So um, we definitely um, encourage um, everybody to, to look at these principles and to um, adopt them as much as possible um, as, as um, the different uh, scenarios as, as Nati Karfi will, will explain. So thank you very much for this very comprehensive presentation. Um, I uh, would like to uh, just move, move on to the Q&A session. Uh, for that, I will ask uh, Mr. Henry Wake uh, to just open his mic and help us in, in moderating that session. I hope uh, the different participants as on session number one this past Tuesday were, uh, are ready to, to, to share the questions with, with, um, with Natalia uh, on the different aspects here uh, and whatever principle or resource uh, was explained. So, uh, Henry, the mic is yours. Um, are you there? Good morning, guys. Uh, good morning, Mike. Can you hear me? Yes, Henry. Yes. Again, wonderful presentation. Uh, very, very informative, uh, Natalia. Um, and greetings from Belize. Uh, we're connecting all the way in Belize. Um, and you see we have uh, some great participants, 13 in number. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, the first session was very informative, opening up our eyes to what open data is uh, and understanding more about the benefits of, of open data um, and your guide uh, your presentation again adds to that so I, I want to uh, thank you for that uh, informative and comprehensive presentation so as Mike said uh, to the group uh, we're now open for questions so guys uh, please feel free um, all participants feel free to start sharing your questions in the chat box so that we could uh, have Natalia address uh, any questions or comments that you'd like uh, address at this point in time. Let me start with one, uh, Henry, uh, while, while our um, colleagues in Belize uh, get ready. Uh, um, you stated, Natalia, that probably principle number one, open by default, is uh, one of the most controversial ones. We have uh, as an organization helping countries on, on starting uh, open data initiatives. We have faced that. We have faced uh, in the different dialogues that we had 
the first encounter with that, you know, uh, I mean, opening data uh, as scary it is, um, uh, why opening by default, and why, why opening by default really means, uh, which is not necessarily, again, to just opening every single piece of data that we have, uh, but thinking, uh, a way of culture of thinking that information from the very beginning when it's produced could be uh, designed um, to be to be open. Um, uh, you talk about metadata as well, um, and, and, and that's important. Um, uh, so, what have been the most? Um, what's the pattern, basically, when countries uh, that you have seen when countries or governments face this? Um, um, first principle opening by default and what has been the experience of the open data shatter what have the open data shatter seen um, uh, in terms of the progress from from understanding in, in, in that culture of openness through this uh, very first principle any thoughts that you might have on that um, would be highly appreciated here. one of the main challenges when you propose to open up the government and especially to open up data is the, um, is the culture uh, within government. So open government and open data has to be seen and has to be understood as a cultural change within government. And because it is a cultural change, it's a process. Uh, it, cultural change doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it's a process that you have to, to start someday. Uh, and, and keep on working. So that's where I see uh, the open by default principle being, being useful. I know it's a challenge, but you have to set the, the, the bar really high and, and having that horizon uh, always in, in, like up there and uh, in, when you're designing your open, open data policy. Uh, I think can also help throughout one of the most critical processes that, can, uh, that an open data policy can go through, which is a change of administration. Uh, because we've seen regionally a lot of cases where there was a lot of political will and a lot of technical development and in building up these this new uh, open data portals and open data policies. Um, and then out of probably... Uh, probably misunderstanding uh, the open the open data policies have been have been left out uh, when when there was a change of, of administration so the charter is a great tool to set that that high bar and help out through the through the process of, of public administration so that everybody has a clear uh, a clear horizon to be worked into, and once you, you've adopted, it's also a tool that can help civil society um, uh, help throughout the process of, of uh, changes in administration. As I said, uh, open government, it's, it's, a, it's a cultural change, and so we see uh, the first principle, open by default, as a horizon to, to look out to. Of course, we would like to have all the all the data opened um, super easily and 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 fast, but we know it's a process. And the biggest challenge, I think, is not technical. Uh, there's a lot of solutions that have been developed, uh, but the biggest challenge is this cultural change. To have this, uh, like, to to internalize this idea that public officials are the creators of data but are not the owners of it, and that Actually, the citizens are the owners of the data that the government uh, creates. Uh, and that's a big change for governmental officials. It was a big change for me, I know, um, because when I entered uh, my first position as government official, it was 10 to 11 years ago, and now for government has uh, at least eight or seven years uh, in place. So the discussion around the, the principle within itself um, it has to do with, with that, uh, that the governments think that they adopt the charter and they need to open up everything right away. And um, so we've had 
really big discussions about this. Um, if it were maybe a possibility to to work on the wording of this first principle and make it looser, uh, that we've always come up with the same answer that uh, this principle should be kept as it is and and being explained and communicated as a as a as a horizon. Uh, and so we ask the adopters for the for the list of steps that they will take to address this principle. Um, and I think that that's it. Okay, so in Argentina we have um, a personal data law, like a, for a long, long time now, that uh, states uh, which which data is considered uh, public and which one is considered personal. And you can ask, actually, there's an agency where you can go and do a complaint when you think either the government or, or, or Great. We have a question from Inaldi Gomez uh, from the immig uh, Immigration Department here in Belize. What examples of legislation can you share that were tied to open data in your country? Belize does not have any laws governing data integrity at the moment. Um, and would this type of legislation be relevant to open data? Using your personal data for other purposes that, than the purpose that was shared for. Um, and then Argentina took 15 years to have a freedom of information law. I was part of that, uh, of that movement that was uh, developing the, the project. And so from 2016, we have an, uh, a freedom of information law uh, that obviously states the, the legal framework on how the, the citizens can ask for information from the government. But as we took so much time, now it's a super modern access of information law because it has open data within the law. So we worked with the Congress. We, as, as the government of Argentina, because I was part of the government of Argentina at that time, we work with the Congress on having uh, one chapter on data that should be open by default, uh, and it's key data sets on anti-corruption fight. Uh, so within the, the, the freedom of information law, we have an open data uh, chapter that states a certain data sets that all the ministries uh, have to publish and are now publishing uh, whether the citizenship acts, asks uh, for them or not. Uh, but it was out of, a, out of a bad thing, which is that we had to fight for 15 years to have a freedom of information. No, we ended up with a super good uh, freedom, of, freedom of information, a super modern one. I'm afraid I don't have it in English to share, but uh, I can share the, the Spanish link. Hi, Michael. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Um, when, you, when you say entities recompile and sell, those would be private uh, entities or governmental entities? Because we've had problems with... with we've had some cases where governmental, governmental institutions did that. Okay, private entities. So the, the uh, We have a second question coming from another Michael here in Belize, Michael Link. Uh, he's from uh, Natural Resources Department here in Belize. His question is, one, how do you deal with exploitation of open data? Entries recompile and sell this data. Entities, sorry, entities recompiling and selling the data. How do you deal with that? And two, acquiring data has a cost. Does this open data come at a cost to the public? Great questions, Mike. Deal with uh, that's part of the of the added value chain uh, that that is developed uh, developed out of the open data policies. Uh, so if there is a public entity that is reusing um, the data sense. to create a new um, yes, a, a, a new yes, business, and then he pays his taxes because and his company is growing, so he has more people working for him. Uh, that's part of, of the of the return uh, of opening up data. So we don't we you don't deal with with, with that. You just um, try to actually develop better data sets and better high quality data sets 
to have more businesses created around open data. Uh, and you can see a very good example on uh, that the GovLab of New York developed, which is Open Data 500, which is a list of companies in the United States that uh, has as its core business open data. Uh, so they, they called it Open Data 500 because when they first started, uh, they thought they would only find find 500 companies. Uh, but then, I don't remember the exact name they came about, but it was like 1,500 companies at its first um, first year of research. So it's, it's one of the ways this pays off, uh, you would say. Uh, and then, yes, opening up data is not for free, so it should be part of a of a public budget, and it will it will have a cost. Excellent. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, any other questions, guys? I see we have uh, a comment and a question combined from uh, Juan Pablo, Ministry of Health. Uh, yesterday, we were introduced to the concept that a phased approach to developing open data is more uh, is a more practical framework for reaching sustainable open. There's data. actually not one uh, uh, one way to go about this. Argentina has a uh, ministerial open data portals and then one central portal that gathers all that information in one portal. With a um, open data Chile has one central portal and that's it. Um, have you seen other approaches it, that have it has to be It ha has to be thinked about uh, within the scope of uh, and the organization of, of each government. Um, and, and depending on where the open data policy is going to be, because there are certain countries where uh, the open data policy is led by the chief of staff, so it makes sense to have one portal. Uh, there are certain countries that have uh, open data policy uh, driven by, for example, Argentina, the modernization ministry, but it's one ministry that has exactly the same level as the other ministries. Um, so it depends, it, that is actually something that you should think about, and also depends on the on the capacities of each of the ministries. Maybe there's, a, there's one ministry that is super modern within their own systems and their data infrastructure and, um, and wants to start. Uh, but it's always important to have at least one central portal where all the information is, is together and then figure out if, if ministerial open data uh, portals are in, into place or, or not. Um, that is totally up to you, and there's not one recipe. Uh, it has to do with the idiosyncrasy of each country. Um, so, I, I, sorry, I cannot be more helpful, but we've seen zillion of cases uh, being successful or not. Uh, but it, it actually depends on on the country. And then I'm seeing in all this in all this uh, question. Um, so um, the <laughs> I would say the Organization of American States, the IDB, the World Bank. They all have uh, teams that work on on freedom of information, open data, and open government. So I would I would go and speak uh, with with them uh, to have this this policy put into place. There is actually a, Again, thank you, Natalia. Okay. a uh, model, a template of a freedom of, of information law that the Organization of, of American States created uh, that has been the base of most of the open, of the, of the freedom of information laws in the whole hemisphere. Uh, it's a great document to, to take a look at. And of course, then develop the, the specifics of each country. 
uh, but I think Mike can can talk a, a little bit more about that. But I think it's international cooperation, the World Bank, the, the Organization of American States, and the IDB. They all have divisions that work on this, and we collaborate with them, as, as you can see. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Natalia. Any other questions, guys? I see uh, Natalia already okay, addressed Okay, thanks for, for the question. From, well, I think uh, um, from my perspective, of, uh, you're in the right path, uh, collaborating uh, with the Organization uh, of American Mike, States and um, that, or maybe share having conversations with people on, that have gone uh, through this. As I said, there's a lot of things that have already been developed and that could be reused as even the code of the Open Data Portal, the most... Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Henry. So, um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm aligned with um, Nati's response about uh, no size fits all uh, and that things uh, move in different ways uh, within the countries. And so uh, we had we had experience and there's uh, long debates that take place along the processes that we start with countries when generating uh, open data national policies on specific ways to uh, finally publish the open data uh, uh, open data data sets. So uh, we've seen we've seen uh, different ways. We've seen the uh, more federate uh, portals, uh, that, and then the the, the more uh, centralized uh, portals, and also the institutional open data portals as well. Um, so there is a bit of everything there. It's a lot that goes with it. What's what's best? I think um, it's, it's, it's not necessarily for us to say, but for the the different um, dynamics within the country to, to to figure out. And that has to do with uh, what is more effective, uh, what is more efficient, and what is also uh, not so much cost. Um, or, or, or that is also cost effective, let me, let me put it that way. Um, but it has to do also with the different administrative and uh, arrangements within, within the country. Uh, so uh, where you have countries that are more open in terms of um, working across different uh, ministries, um, then then you find more um, more attributes to um, to get ministries to um, use a more centralized um, um, uh, portal. If that's the case, uh, when you don't find that, uh, then uh, then you can you start disaggregating. Uh, but the important part here is one thing that I mentioned on the chat, and it's actually that. Whatever policy or whatever initial uh, open data national guides uh, are developed uh, should be um, should prioritize on talking and encouraging um, the quality of the data um, so that regardless of what's the final arrangement on a portal or how the information is going to be published at the end, you make sure that the uh, the quality that will be published follows certain guidelines that are agreeable by everyone, and they can people can match. An experience of this um, is, for example, uh, a very um, good initiative of one government. I won't say the name, um, but one Central American government um, that quickly moved to develop an open data portal and start loading uh, data sets uh, on that portal. Um, the portal was um, up and uh, live for less than six months uh, because there was uh, all kind of different problems that were associated with the quality of information that was there. Um, and, 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 I'm, and then they have to start uh, working on 
precisely um, improving the quality of data there, uh, and it took um, um, a couple of years until they went back uh, uh, live with the portal, um, and that had to do with going back and start working with different institutions about uh, an, 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 an agreement on, on how to publish open data and so on and so forth. So you have a lot of that, a lot of countries, a lot of governments running to get a portal up and running without taking into consideration the actual uh, data and how to go about publishing uh, um, um, quality, quality data there. So um, it has to do with, with um, how you can move a government to arrange within itself uh, and find those arrangements um, that could be uh, that can make this effective, uh, cost effective, and also um, um, viable. Um, but uh, but it works different in in, in, in different countries. Mm. Um, let me add to the question uh, something about the, the usage of information and value gain uh, of gaining economic gain uh, out of uh, opening of open data as well. And I think uh, there's two things that there's there's one thing that um, not Natalia pointed out, and is that the the information is is, is it doesn't belong to to anyone necessarily, no. It's, it's public data, it's government data. It's 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 the data that has been gathering uh, throughout the function of the of the of the government. Um, and so, in that sense, uh, yeah, it's, it belongs to the institution who's who's um, who gathers it and is publishing, but it's published in a way uh, that is to be used, freely used. Uh, so one thing that is encouraged under open data is actually to actually get value out of the data that is that is open, uh, and that is important. It could be social value, it could be a public service, it could be actually economic gain out of it, uh, but it's transformed. So there's two things to it. One thing is actually getting the data set and selling it, which is not open. It's not what open data is looking for. Uh, in, 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 in the second thing that is most important is actually getting that uh, data set or data sets, whatever it is, transforming it, giving it value, and then developing new products, new services um, and that could lead to economic uh, gain. Now that is that is what open data is also looking for. Um, in my presentations on open data, I show a slide of of the economic value of open data uh, in uh, in Europe. Um, I don't have it here handy, but probably I will share it in a general uh, presentation that I have. Um, there's a lot of value uh, on on opening uh, that could be uh, economic value that could be gained uh, out of opening uh, data, and, and and it's not for the government. Uh, to be the, the intermediary who take that information and generate value on it. Now, some ministries see value on certain information that is often from another ministry. They take it also. They become intermediaries on get, adding value to that information, but it's not necessarily the end user. Uh, but as a part of its own um, functions, uh, it works. I think I mentioned it on the last session specifically information on uh, the environment, climate, and other things are of interest of other ministries as well who might be, uh, who might need um, that information. And so they become intermediaries, add a layer of information, an app, an app, an application, um, and, 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 and it's used for their own purposes. The same happened with outsiders, the third parties, outside government could take that open data and uh, add value to it. I leave it there. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so, in terms of uh, other questions, guys, uh, I see we have uh, different comments coming in. Uh, do we have any more questions for Natalia or Mike? Feel free to share your your uh, comments and questions in the chat link, guys. Uh, but I had a question, uh, Natalia. 
in terms of the uh, um, creation of that open data policy, seeing that that this is such a new concept here in Belize, um, we're really uncovering the different benefits, understanding what open government is, uh, and finding out how we can uh, use it to to better the lives of the average citizen here in Belize, and with such a tiny population. Uh, um, uh, what has been your experience for new developing countries um, embracing uh, open data? Um, because again, it's it's so new to us. There's still a lot of education that needs to to take place. There's quite a bit of um, work that needs to to get done, which is part of of the project that we're working on. But um, from your uh, experience, again, um, how have have um, countries new to open data embraced it, and what would be some of the the uh, recommendations or, or takeaways uh, that you've seen with those countries um, embracing open data? It's it's code is open and you can actually create your own open data portal without um, spending uh, one dime on the code. As I said, open and up data is not, is not uh, free. There's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learning that you could do and Probably the best recommendation I, I could do is to try to figure out which country was in the same position you are today and have a clear conversation with, with the public officials. There's a, you will, you will uh, get to experience there's a lot of super honest conversations that you will have with the public officials that have developed these this processes in other countries and they will share the do's and the don'ts. Um, then another thing is to have the proper team in place. Uh, you you need to to have not not a uh, like a super big team to get started, but you need to have the technical support, the legal support, uh, uh, and of course the, the public su uh, the political support. But as far as as a team, you need to have people that understand about data infrastructure, about data sets, about uh, data mining uh, to to develop those those data sets that will be published, uh, a, a good uh, legal advice so you can uh, put all, all the legal framework in place. And then, uh, of course, somebody or some team, because this is important, somebody in charge of the connections outside of government. Uh, have, I don't know if it says public relations or wh whatever, but uh, you need to engage with outside actors to, to develop this policy and to, to collaborate while you're developing this, this policy in order to have a, a successful open data uh, policy. Um, that would be my, my advice. And then to, to start publishing, to understand what that means, you know, uh, gathering. You don't need to have like a zillion data sets to open up your portal. Uh, and the process of publishing and the process of, of creating some challenges around those, those first data sets and so gathering community around that first version of the, of, the data, of the open data portal. You don't need to have everything uh, in place. Like I want every ministry to be involved in this. Those are conversations that will take place because this is part of a cultural change. Um, so just go with, with the ministries that are more keen on opening up data and have are better positioned uh, as far as their data infrastructure goes um, and they're more open to collaborate with, with you. Um, I see here at least 13 people that are going to be working on, on this and that's a pretty, a pretty good number uh, to get started. Um, but those would be my recommendations. Just a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning, and uh, because there's people that has gone through what you're going through right now, and there's a lot of lessons learned. Uh, and and the community of open data in the region is super collaborative. Uh, and uh, Mike knows uh, about that because he's been working on this for a long, long time. And government officials are super collaborative, and civil society also. Yeah, thanks. Um, the thing is, every ministry develops and creates data of, of the topic they address uh, as the key public policy creator. So 
if you want to publish climate change uh, data, uh, you need to engage with them in order to help them develop uh, the data sets that then you'll be publishing. Great, thank you, Natalia. Okay, I see a comment there uh, from Mr. Ball. Uh, if Mike can share the name of the site or system that Natalia is referring to. Okay, CCAT, okay. Yes, so um, would, would you like to also maybe add on that um, as well, Mike, in terms of the different groups, the different partners and agencies uh, that uh, because what we're trying to do here is create this core working group of government officials to drive the open data and open government uh, agenda forward. So by maybe providing linkages to uh, some of the more regional uh, groups, uh, we can start to explore and take note of their experiences, um, things that they've uh, gone through to, to make, uh, I guess, developing the open data, not just the open data policy, but the mindset, changing that mindset, getting a better understanding of the benefits of open data and open government. Uh, is there anything uh, you'd like to add on top of what Natalia mentioned, Mike? Henry, I'm, I'm sorry, I lost you on the last uh, on the last question. No, I was just saying, uh, seeing that we're creating this uh, core group of uh, open government and open data champions on the GOB side with um, the participants here in this training session. I was just wondering if you could also add uh, or if there's anything else to add on what Natalia mentioned in terms of the regional groups uh, that we could per perhaps create those linkages with so that our Belize core working group can uh, liaise and start communicating with them. Yes, thank you, Henry. Uh, so we specifically, specifically from the Organization of American States, um, facilitate the regional open data working group. There's a number of uh, 13 countries, 14 countries participating of that working group. It's a reduced group also, uh, who actually began in 2013, four countries um, uh, leading uh, the, the open data movement uh, four governments uh, in, in, that became now 14. And so um, those country, th that working group is hosted in a network called the um, the County Government Network of uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, uh, where CITO um, participates in, 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 in participates in the network. Uh, not necessarily up to now in the working group. And I think uh, that working group is, is what is uh, linking to um, different uh, exchange uh, scenarios to improve open data at the regional level and of course to be a support group for those processes at the national level. Um, that's important. So at the margins of an upcoming regional meeting and international meeting that will take place in Argentina in September, uh, this working group will be meeting um, and um, we will discuss uh, in different scenarios. Uh, it will work on its own work, um, setting annual plans on open data um, and reaching, uh, reaching objectives that the group sets for. Uh, that's important. For example, one of them currently being worked on by Argentina is developing a regional um, metadata framework. And, and, and Argentina is leading that process together with other countries. And uh, by the end of this year, there will there will be a, uh, a regional uh, metadata framework, uh, and that will be a resource for our country, so all countries. So all countries can tap in, uh, including Belize. That's important. Uh, that's just an example of the work of the working group, uh, and we're gonna be doing that. The other scenario is actually getting together with other leaders open data leaders of the world, since this will be an international open data conference, uh, to share experiences. And in, in, in Latin America, the good news is that Latin America, it's, it's a driving force uh, for the advancements of open data in the world. And that's also good to say. You have countries like Argentina, 
Colombia, Mexico, Uruguay, Chile, who have been at the leading front worldwide, in, in, in regardless of those countries, uh, many of the other countries of the region are being very supportive of the different open data processes. And so we have in Latin America the most vibrant open data ecosystem that is made up of governments and civil society together. And that's very important. That's one product that we have to show as a region. The second one is actual commitments at the highest level. And this year we reached two important commitments to use open data to combat corruption at the margins of the Summit of the Americas, where our presidents and chief of the states uh, agree to use open data. And that's the first uh, commitment ever made by a region as a whole in open data. You find commitments by groups of countries like the G7, the G8, the G20, uh, but not necessarily as a region that is very diverse to use open data. So we conquered that. That's something that we have to show. Another product that we have to, uh, we can show the world. That's important. And the second commitment that follows that one of the Summit of the Americas uh, this year in Lima, Peru, is the uh, also the political commitment set by the General Assembly that the Ministries of External Relations or Foreign Affairs of the countries of the Americas to pursue that uh, commitment set by the presidents of using open data to combat corruption. So all those things uh, have been achieved uh, thanks to the work of this uh, of this network. And, and so we hope that those networks could be continue being a resource now for, for, for Belize. Uh, that's what I get my passion to work on this from the Organization of American States uh, because I know countries are doing it and doing it well and are supporting other countries in this process. Policies are important as well as technical aspects and, and, and so this, 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 own, this very own training session uh, is, is a result of that and we hope it will be effective also uh, in, in Belize. Thank Excellent. You, thank you, Mike. And thank you again, Natalia. I, I see in the comment section, uh, Natalia is addressing uh, a comment by Inali Gomez, again from uh, Immigration, uh, on uh, the question being, or the comment being, uh, so you're saying that open data cannot be achieved by just one department in government, but by a collaborative effort from every government entity that can form a core committee, along with representative of outside stakeholders that can collaborate as well and contribute. I saw you have two comments there. Uh, Natalia, would you like, would you like to uh, ex uh, of the open data policy, but um, like public transportation, if there's a, tra a, a transportation ministry, uh, so you need to engage with the other ministries because they are creating the, the like the vertical uh, data sets uh, on the topics they work on. So, so that's that's a must. Uh, of course, there's going to be easier conversations with certain ministries and tougher ones. Uh, but in order to be able to publish, you need to have those conversations with them and, and engage with them. Uh, and then, as I said, it's really important to help develop the reusers community also so that when you open up data, there's actually somebody there expecting it and, and reusing it and creating this added public value. Policy. No. It was politics. <laughs> um, I have to be bluntly honest. Uh, there wasn't much um, political will for the law to pass. Um, so that was it. It wasn't the, the, like the technical side. Thank you, Natalia. Are there any more questions, guys? Please feel free to uh, share your questions. Uh, I know we're almost uh, we're at 10:30 at this moment, uh, so maybe another five, ten minutes. Uh, we open for discussions, comments, questions. Uh, is that okay, Mike? Sure, here we have some time. Um, we can take final.
Uh, Natalia, you'd mentioned uh, that Argentina took 15 years to uh, enable its legislation, uh, which you noted is quite uh, an advanced piece of legislation. Uh, could you share with us um, uh, the process um, and why such a long period of time? Uh, on, on the scope of the law and the technicality, but uh, as uh, I mentioned, and then Mike just uh, wrote on, on the chat, there's there's this uh, baseline Politics. that was written by, by the Organization of American States, and there's a lot of countries to learn from uh, that have already developed their own, uh, their own freedom of information laws in Argentina. I think it had to do with, with politics and, and agreements or disagreements among uh, political parties. Uh, it, it, it didn't have to do with the, with the, with the technicalities or, or even the implementations. Uh, it, was, it was mostly that. The one good thing was that as we took a lot of time, now we have a really modern uh, freedom of information law, but um, it, it was mostly that, I have to be bluntly honest. I think it had to do with different, different things. The president introduced a new, a new law project, so that, that was a statement of a, a political will. Um, and then, unfortunately, like every country in the, in the region, um, we had a lot of, of corruption cases, big corruption cases that were starting to pop up. And so there was... And, and how was, uh, towards the end, how was that overcome, seeing that, that politics, which in, in pretty much all of our, our countries uh, within the region plays a huge part in development of, of uh, the country on a whole, uh, how was that, those political hurdles overcome? Uh, did we see, uh, did you guys see in Argentina uh, um, new thinking, forward thinking by, uh, by the new politicians that, that took power? Claim to have this kind of, this law and other laws passed through Congress in order to be able to fight corruption within government. Uh, so there was a, a, both a momentum from uh, the, the politicians and uh, having the president introduce this, this project and um, um, like an Argentinian momentum on, on anti-corruption. Everybody was, was uh, talking about that and this piece of law is one of the key laws uh, in order to have a proper anti-corruption policy. So I guess it, it was just uh, at, a, at a time where everything aligned, you know, um, and, and the political wheel, we had a good, a good project, and these scandals that unfortunately uh, pop up m moved forward the, the, the process. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, thanks to you. Um, thanks to Henry and everybody that connected and asked good questions. Um, you can reach out to me as many times as you want. Uh, the charter is, is there for you. Um, we, we will help as much as we can. And, um, and Avi is just, uh, if you want to keep on uh, learning. Certainly, Mike. Can I add uh, Henry to that um, a bit? Uh, we have worked with different countries on, on, on this uh, generation of uh, open data policy supporting them in the processes. And I think, you know, Natalia, Natalia is right. Um, regardless, there, there's one thing that has to go, has to do with the, uh, the, the own ideologies um, that um, surround uh, the different uh, policies uh, within a country, and, and there, there needs to be a, a breakthrough uh, through it. So you have that, uh, but you also have to consider the approach. In those two things, regardless if it's uh, an ideological uh, um, framework or if it's uh, the approach, um, you need something very important to continue pursuing this, and that's knowledge. So there is a lot of misunderstanding about uh, many different things. Like that goes with the ideology as well, and that affects the way you approach things to make it happen. So, um, yeah, things started with uh, uh, the freedom, uh, the Access of Information Acts, 
uh, countries to adopt it, develop it, and start actually adjusting it throughout throughout time. Um, so 15 years, it's okay. Then you get you get changes in the middle, um, not only because there's a political aspect to it, but because we have evolved as a society in Latin America and the Caribbean. So. Uh, and also, there's different contexts. One of the very important contexts of this is actually open government. Uh, the open government, the paradigm that kicks in in the in, in, in the countries that are working uh, along, along those lines. At the same time, there is new, better technology as well that kicks in, and then there's government, and most importantly, the citizen. And that created a new citizen as well. We're talking within the next, within the last 10 years. So there is a combination of factors that have uh, take us to, to this point and the quick advancements. Um, definitely the pressure of a new citizen that is much more informed and have ways to communicate much more, much more quickly uh, with the government, and not just with the government, uh, but uh, with society uh, through social media. It, that's 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 important, and so governments start taking into consideration a few things. First of all, in getting ready technically uh, to uh, do better uh, service delivery. But with that, actually getting to the final uh, end, end user, which is the the, the citizen. Uh, and then, uh, on the other hand, you have the citizen. So you have a combination of factors, and then there is open government, this paradigm that kicks in, uh, and, uh, and, and, to, and to do uh, governance. And um, and all this required knowledge in the middle, because uh, that's part of what we're doing here with this training. Uh, the misunderstanding of many things that have been actually holding back uh, policy improvement. And so you have the access of information laws, and then you start tweaking uh, here and there to make sure that it's not, we're not talking now only about passive transparency and active transparency, uh, whereas access of information is considered the passive transparency and open data is more the active transparency. So um, you have those two things that will lead to the same place, just giving information to whoever requested the information, but not now who just who does who request the information, but just make it available uh, and, and have citizens and, and, and people informed. And so that's important, that goes along, and that's a mindset change that is start making precisely uh, improving those, those, uh, those, those legal frameworks. Then there is a difference between a policy that is worked on under an executive order, for example, or a decree. Uh, we have help on those ones um, right now uh, of what I call uh, basically a second generation of, uh, not the first generation of open data policies, uh, where actually governments take a step on improving their policies, but it's not yet a law, it's, it's a policy. And so uh, then, um, what's, what's, what we see in this progress is that at some point, probably some countries much more closer to other, others, will make a jump to, to making it a law. We're not there yet, uh, but as, as, not as an access of information, but as an open data policy, uh, there will be open data laws uh, but that will take place also in that it's 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 also complicated when it goes through a, 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 a you know a, 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 a process to be approved in Parliament. Of course, um, different that when it's a policy and it's agreed by cabinet, uh, by the ministries, and signed by by, by the president. Um, now, the other part that goes with it is that these policies, these new policies, are also embedded in the commitments that the countries have made to the open government partnership. So in response to the commitments that the countries made internationally, uh, then the, the end result is having new policies. And so that's good because the countries are committing to it and they have to respond to those commitments. And so there's new policies there too as well. Um, 
and, and so there's different frameworks that are out there. Uh, OTP, Open Garden Plan should be one of them uh, that has also uh, support that processes. Thank you. Um, Henry, uh, we might be leading to the end of the of the session, but um, let's let's see if we can wrap it up. If there are no more questions, and I know also Natalia has more things to do, a lot more things, and, and, and so we thank her for her time. Um, and, and we agree all, including with the participants, that. Um, okay. Thank you, Mike. Thank you again, Natalia. Um, I I do believe uh, that it. I think we've exhausted in terms of questions here, Mike. Uh, as you rightly mentioned, uh, you know, it's been a very informative session. Uh, I know I gained uh, quite a bit of knowledge. Uh, and my, my uh, participation or work uh, within the project is, is uh, informing me tremendously on open data and open government. Uh, so, uh, again, I want to thank you, Natalia, uh, for joining us today and sharing with us uh, a very informative presentation. Uh, I know, Mike, um, we're going to be putting packaging together the uh, chat info and presentation to share with participants as well as the video. Uh, I know that they're eager to, to review the materials as well. And uh, as soon, if there, if there are any other questions, guys, uh, at the end of the session or, or later on during the course of today, uh, until we, we meet again next week, Tuesday, please feel free to, to email me. I'm going to be sharing, again, my contact information in the chat. Um, and also, please feel free to, to join and like and share our Facebook page uh, in terms of getting the word out on the project and what we're doing. There's a lot of exciting work uh, coming up. Uh, I know Mike is going to agree and, and uh, uh, agree with me on that. Uh, so look forward to a lot more uh, activities with regards to the project. Uh, with that said, Mike, if there's any other closing statements, uh, comments on your end, Natalia, also. I uh, just want to thank Natalia, of course, uh, for her time and the Open Data Chatter. Uh, thank you for the insights that uh, have been brought. Uh, a partner of the OES, um, and, and we're happy to, to do so. There's different works that the Open Data Chatter will continue to do. Uh, one of them is revamping those six principles. Uh, work that is being done already globally, and, and it will be will be um, will be also um, um, done in this international and regional conference that I mentioned will take place in Argentina in September. So uh, there is work that continues to be done with the Open Data Charter. I want to thank you, uh, Natalia, and the Open Data Charter for that. And just for the participants, just to leave a, a side note on this, uh, as, a, as this is our second training session, um, and, and we see a particular instrument uh, that uh, it's uh, that contemplates to be adopted uh, within this group that we're training, uh, and of course the work on this project promoting open government ecosystem in Belize that has Mr. Henry Wade on the ground in Belize, uh, um, we. We will uh, make ourselves available uh, to support as much as possible the development and the improvement and advancement of open data in Belize, and that's what we're doing here with this. Hopefully, one day, uh, the agreement of, of this group, uh, the different activities that we're going to have on site here in Belize, um, and the support, the technical assistance that we'll be giving to Belize within the framework of this project could lead precisely to the adoption of these principles and, and to facilitate that. So for that, I'll just leave it there um, and, and leave, you, leave you with that, with that, with that uh, so um, that we can work um, throughout the rest of the, the project uh, along, along those lines. Um, that said, uh, that's all on, on, on my side. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, all the participants. Thank you to Sitcher again, who's connected and, and who's our host. Uh, for the next sessions, we will also accommodate, uh, as Henry has been working and coordinating with CITO, to have you all together in the CITO training session, uh, in, in, in some of these sessions, uh, so that you can all gather together 
um, get out of the online place uh, of this and, and get into the, the, the actual live uh, phase of this uh, together with Henry. Um, not more about open government. Next week, the Open Government Partnership has its global uh, summit. So I'm traveling tomorrow to Georgia, and there's going to be a few sessions that are going to that are going to be transmitted via uh, internet. So you can you can have it. Uh, you you can take a look at at, at that and and learn from from others' experiences. Uh, I'll be talking about the charter, which you already know, but uh, there's a lot of interesting sessions going on. So hopefully you'll be able to connect. Uh, and thank you very much for this space and for the patience and the time. And looking forward. Okay, with that, I guess it's uh, official. We close this session. Uh, Mike, Natalia, again, a big thank you connecting with us. Uh, Mike in DC, Natalia in Argentina. Um, and uh, we look forward to another session on next week, Tuesday, Mike. I believe that's starting at 10 a.m. Just another reminder to our uh, participants here. 10 a.m. Tuesday, July 17th. All right. So again, thank you, Natalia. Thank you, Mike. Thank you all. And uh, have a wonderful day ahead. And safe travels, Natalia.